This week's challenge, God is only forgiving when he smells fresh blood, right? Uh, the challenge is that God requires sacrifice in order to forgive. This seems savage on his part. Why is this necessary? Well, here's the first thing that I think we have to do with this challenge is we have to embrace it. Uh, as uh, followers of Christ who take the Bible seriously, this is what's communicated in Scripture. Hebrews 9.22 says there is no forgiveness without the shedding of blood. So this is not a challenge that we can kind of downplay or dismiss. I think we can move towards this challenge and answer it in a satisfactory kind of way. Now, the first thing that we have to do is we have to get clear on who God is. What is God's nature? And so the challenger who wants to raise this, I guess I want to ask them some questions. What do you understand about the God of the Bible? What is his nature? What, is it, what are his characteristics? What are his attributes? Because that is going to be important in understanding this issue of atonement and sacrifice. And so when we look at God and who he is, uh, we understand that he is the moral law giver. Right? So from his very nature of goodness flow moral laws. They, they, from his moral nature, he issues moral commands that then form our obligations. So we have obligations to, to follow these commands. So he is the, the moral law giver. But he is also, at the same time, the just judge. He's the one who is responsible for executing justice. And so when moral law is broken, justice requires that there is, is punishment. And of course, in the Christian worldview, when you have the, the holy God of the universe issuing moral commands, you have human beings who are sinful and evil in our response. And ultimately, we rebel and we, uh, we commit the greatest sin imaginable, and that is to reject our Creator. Okay, this then helps put some context to this challenge. So the appropriate response of the holy, just judge and moral lawgiver is death, right? For human beings, the appropriate price that we pay is death for the greatest sin imaginable. So with a proper understanding of God now, we're in a place then to kind of look more carefully at the idea of blood atonement and sacrifice and make sense of this. And so you have this perfect, holy, just judge who is responsible for executing justice. The price of sin ultimately is death, but he's also merciful, so he wants to provide a way out for us in his love for us. So what does he have to do? Well, uh, think, about, think about a human judge, right? You got a human judge who, um, is, let's say he's going to allow me to take the place of some criminal, right? So there's a criminal on death row. And he says, all right, I'm, I'm, Brett, I'm gonna let you be the substitute for him. And I say, okay, here's five bucks. It's gonna cost me, it's gonna cost me five bucks, five bucks, let the guy go, and, uh, and, and we're good, right? Now, of course, the judge is gonna look at me and go, no, it doesn't, it doesn't work that way, right? If I'm gonna be the substitute, then my punishment is going to have to be equivalent to the punishment that uh, is required of the criminal. And so the criminal who, who is on death row, I can't pay five bucks and say, yeah, let's, you know, let's, let's um, count it even, right? It, there's not an equivalency there. In the same way, if death is the cost for our sin and our rebellion, then it seems to me that you have to have an equivalent Right? And so for a while, you had blood sacrifice kind of standing in the place for the ultimate blood sacrifice uh, to, to, to cover human sin. And then ultimately, God takes the punishment on himself, not just an innocent man, Jesus, because Jesus is God in human flesh. He takes the punishment on himself and sacrifices himself, uh, Christ, on the cross in order to pay for our sin, right? To, to be that substitute. And so instead of our blood being shed, Jesus' blood is being shed. So there's an equivalent sacrifice or substitution. So the shedding of blood is a substitutionary act that is required in order to actually pay the penalty. And so it's not that, you know, kind of this negative way of putting it that God is just, he's, 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 you know, bloodthirsty or he's just, he only forgive if he smells blood. No, he's a just judge. And so the price 
of sin has to be satisfied. The punishment for sin has to be satisfied if he's going to be a just judge. Let me also add this. I think the shedding of blood communicates uh, some other things that are important that maybe help us to wake up to, I guess, the severity of the problem, right? So the shedding of blood communicates the severity of sin and human rebellion. If you think about this objection, right, it, it kind of takes the, the blame and puts it on God rather than accepting the blame for our own evil. And so we say, well, you know, God, you, you, can't, you can't just forgive people. You got to require blood. And, and so it shifts the blame to God. But what about our own evil, right? And so I think the, the, the idea of the shedding of blood communicates the seriousness of our evil. And, and think about it. The, the person who often will raise this objection will often raise, you know, uh, the, the, the problem of, of evil and say, how can God be good and loving and just and all this if he allows evil? Well, okay, he's going to deal with evil, and he's going to deal with it as a just judge. And now you're not happy with that. I think the whole idea of the shedding of blood communicates the seriousness of sin. It communicates the seriousness of our rebellion, and it helps us to see how sin uh, and death just do such damage uh, to humanity and to God's world. Let me close with Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 through 14, because this really helps capture uh, a proper understanding of the sacrifice of animals and ultimately the sacrifice of Christ. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. And so the good news, the good news is blood atonement. The good news is that Jesus took our place on the cross. He was the substitute that paid the appropriate price for our sin. That's good news.